So Lenny is in bed with his best friend's wife. When they hear a car come in the driveway, it's the husband. Lenny jumps out of bed, runs into the hallway closet and hides. Just as the husband comes sauntering in the door to hang up his coat, he opens the door to hang up his coat, and there he sees Lenny, his best friend, standing there, stark naked. He says, Lenny, what are you doing here? And Lenny goes, everybody's got to be somewhere. <laughs> so when Danny called me up and told me that joke a few years back, that was the first time we realized that there's hidden cultural wisdom embedded in jokes. Because as Ethan mentioned, Danny and I both majored in philosophy together many, many years ago. So when Danny told me the story, I said, Danny, you see what's going on in that joke? Lenny, the guy in the closet, is giving a Hegelian answer to what was intended as an existentialist question. Naturally. <laughs> so obvious. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Danny said, well, what, what exactly do you mean? I said, well, you know, Hegel did philosophy from up in the stratosphere. You know, he operated at a very high level of abstraction. You know, he was looking down on the whole sweep of human history as if he wasn't a part of it. And then Kierkegaard and the existentialists, Heidegger, Sartre, and so forth, came along and they said, well, you can't do meaningful human philosophy from up in the clouds. You know, if you want to talk to human beings about philosophy, you've got to be where we are on the ground, you know, in the concrete moment, you know, with our fears and our anxieties and our dread and our fear of death and so on and so forth. So, obviously, as Danny said, Lenny, the guy in the closet, is trying to give a very abstract answer because he doesn't want to answer the existential question, what are you, Lenny, of all people, doing in my closet without your clothes? So, the interesting thing is that what people who don't know Hegel from a bagel recognize, recognize it when they see it, you know? You all saw the difference between the Hegelian answer and the existentialist answer, and everybody laughed. And when Tom said that, I, I thought, I wonder if there are more jokes that do that. I bet you there are a lot of jokes that have in their basis some philosophical import. And I said, gee, I don't think so, Danny. Maybe four or five. I, I don't remember I, I, any joke. Anyhow, so what we did, we've known each other for so long. Every once in a while, we go on a little vacation together. So we went on a vacation with our wife's permission. And we went on a little vacation together, and we took a pile of old philosophy books, we still read that stuff for some reason, and a pile of joke books. And we started making matches, matches, matches. And we made them in all the major areas of philosophy, evaluative philosophy, that would be moral philosophy, ethics and aesthetics, in epistemology, theories of knowledge, what does it mean to know something, uh, logic, you know, one of the very basic studies in, in philosophy, and uh, in metaphysics, those are the big questions. What does it all mean? You know, what's it all about Alfie? What is being compared to nothingness? What does it mean for an object to have characteristics that differentiate it from other objects? Really basic stuff. Aristotle, it turns out, 2,500 years ago, said everything that is has two different kinds of characteristics what he called essential characteristics, and what he called accidental characteristics. He said essential characteristics are the characteristics that make a thing what it is. If it didn't have those characteristics, it wouldn't be that thing. It would be something else altogether. Accidental characteristics are everything else. You know, they might tell you something about how a thing is, or they might be characteristics that a thing sometimes has and sometimes doesn't, but they're accidental. They're not part of the essence. They don't make the thing what it is. So he said, take for example, Socrates. He said, Socrates was essentially rational. That was part of his very essence. So if you came across somebody on the street that you thought was Socrates, and you started a conversation with him, and it turned out you were talking to somebody irrational, you weren't talking to Socrates, because Socrates was essentially rational. He said, on the other hand, he said, Socrates had a snub nose. That's an accidental characteristic. If Socrates had gone and gotten a rhinoplasty, you wouldn't say he's no longer Socrates, right? You'd say he's Socrates with a Roman nose. This reminds me of a joke. No. <laughs> what? It's about this guy Thompson, who hadn't seen the video about living to 100. Poor guy. 
He wanted, but he wanted to live a long time. He was 77. I'm just picking that number at random. <laughs> and so he got a personal trainer. Man, he worked out. He put six inches on his chest. He lower, lost five inches on his waist. He was ripping. He was, what do they call that? Ripped. He was ripped. <laughs> and, then, and then he went and he uh, got a suntan. He was looking good. He decides to top it all off with a sporty haircut gets a sporty haircut, he's feeling really groovy, walks out of the barber shop where he gets run over by a bus. Uh. He's lying there in the gutter, dying. He looks up at the heavens and he says, God, how could you do this to me? And the voice from above says, to tell you the truth, Thompson, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> Accidental <laughs> and essential characteristics. Yeah, the wisdom of jokes. He's changed some accidental characteristics of himself, but he still knows he's essentially Thompson, or he wouldn't have asked the question. You and I still know he's essentially Thompson, or the joke wouldn't work. The only character in the joke who doesn't understand the difference between essential and accidental characteristics is God. So much for omniscient deities, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the next area that we noticed that jokes fell out into, the next area of philosophy was logic. And this was kind of a surprise to us. We thought, really, logic has a lot of jokes? Well, it turned out logic is a gold mine <laughs> of jokes. And early on, the early philosophers did a catalog of all the ways of constructing an argument, all the ways of arguing to a conclusion. And one of these they called the argument from analogy. And the argument from analogy says that if two things are similar, analogous to each other, they must have had a similar cause. That argument doesn't always work very well. It depends, for one thing, on how analogous the two things are to each other. But every once in a while, you hear an argument from analogy that just hits the nail right on the head. This is a, my favorite kind of joke. It's a story within a story. It also involves an old man. Don't ask. <laughs> so this 90-year-old guy, going for a walk, he runs into his doctor. He says, doctor, he says, I'm thrilled. I'm so happy. He says, I married this 18-year-old woman, and we're going to have a baby. The doctor says, let me tell you a story. This is the story within the story. <laughs> he says, this guy decides to go out hunting bear, and on the way out of the door, instead of picking up his gun, he picks up an umbrella. He then proceeds to the woods, where immediately a bear charges him, and he shoots him dead with his umbrella. And the old man who's listening to his doctor said, somebody else must have shot the bear. <laughs> Argument by analogy. <laughs> so the next area that uh, we, we noticed that jokes fell out into, and this is also a gold mine of jokes, epistemology. Epistemology is a $25 word, which means simply theories of knowledge. You know, yeah. how, do, how do we know the things that we think we know? But how not can, cognitive science. It's what do we mean by knowing? What do we mean by knowing? And, and how yeah. can we be sure we're doing it? How do we tell the difference between knowledge and opinion? You know, how can we have any certainty you know, in this changing world? How can we be certain of anything? In the Middle Ages, the big epistemological controversy was between divine revelation on the one hand and human reason on the other. And the argument was, which is the primary source of knowledge? Which is the more certain source of knowledge? Divine revelation or human, the human mind? Yeah. Human Actually, that, that's making a comeback now. I, I don't know whether you're aware of it, but there's this sort of band of modern philosophers called the New Atheists who keep arguing, uh, uh, you know, how can you sustain both divine revelation as, as knowledge and science as knowledge. And particularly, there's one guy named uh, Sam Harris who wrote the book, a uh, very good book, called End of Faith. And he's saying, how can people go through 95% of their days using reason, the reason of science, you know, observation and, and, and reason, uh, and then for three hours on Sunday morning in church turn to another epistemological model? But I have a joke that tells about this conflict. And it's about a man. He's not old. He's walking down, <laughs> he's walking around in the uh, woods, 
He stumbles, he falls into a well. He's falling, he's flailing around, he's falling, falling, he's reaching around. Finally, he latches onto this spindly root, hanging on for dear life. He looks up, all he sees is a circle of light at the very top. He says, is there anybody up there? Nothing. Is there anybody up there? Still nothing. Is there anybody up there? Finally, there's a thunder crack. A darkness descends and a beam shines down and a voice says, I am the Lord your God. Have faith in me and I will save you. Let go of the root. <laughs> Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> <laughs> faith, faith versus reason. Before we go on to the next epistemology, though, I just realized I left out one point of logic. Aristotle also cataloged all the logical fallacies, all the ways that you can screw up an argument and argue to a false conclusion. And one of these is post hoc ergo proctor hoc. After this, therefore because of this, right? Because event A happened before event B, right before event B sometimes, that must mean that A caused B. Well, not necessarily. But politicians love to commit this fallacy. I don't know whether they know they're doing it and they're pulling a fast one on us, or whether they don't really know that it's fallacious. But how often have we heard a politician say, well, marijuana may not be a dangerous drug in itself, but it's a gateway drug, right? Because 85%, they say, of heroin addicts started off with marijuana, which is apparently true. But 100% of them started with milk. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's why we're standing the anti-milk mute. <laughs> the interesting thing about the Proctor Hawk thing is, is that it doesn't mean that argument does not show that uh, uh, marijuana is not necessarily a precursor of taking heroin. It's just that if you took it first and then take heroin, it doesn't mean that one led to the other. Um, it's a difference, a, a major difference. Back to epistemology. So the ironic thing is that in the history of philosophy, in the history of epistemology, neither divine revelation nor reason prevailed as the, the dominant epistemology in the Western world. The, the uh, epistemologists in the 18th century were the British empiricists. And they came along and they said, well, you know, if you want to know something factual about the world, it's not enough to just sit and pray about it, and it's not enough to sit in an armchair and think about it. You actually have to go out and observe the world, right? You have to go out and look at the world. And obviously, this is the philosophy that, that underlies the scientific revolution. And it's become our default position. I bet you have a joke to prove that. I do. Thank you so much for asking. Yeah. <laughs> so there's actually a story that, that illustrates how it's become our dominant position that we take for granted. You know, if, if somebody tells us something that, that purports to be a fact, we just take it for granted that they must have got it by observation. So these three women are standing in the locker room of their club. When all of a sudden, a man goes running through the locker room and he's wearing nothing except a bag over his head. And as he runs through the locker room, the first woman looks him up and down and says, well, at least it's not my husband. <laughs> the second woman looks him over and says, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and the third woman looks him up and down and says, you know, he's not even a member of this club. <laughs> <laughs> the triumph of empiricism. <laughs> My favorite joke. <laughs> so, after the British empiricists, the next major figure in Western epistemology was Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher, and he built on the work of the empiricists. He says that the empiricists awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers. He That's did. the only thing I remember from college. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. fortunately, I remember one more thing because okay, it's good, good, lead good. up to a joke. <laughs> so, Kant said there are two kinds of statements, actually, that give you truth. One he called analytic statements. Those are statements that are true by definition. You know, all horses are animals. He says you don't need to empirically verify that statement. You just have to look up horse in the dictionary. In fact, if you did go out and look at horses and you found something that you thought was a horse, but it turned out it wasn't an animal, 
Well, it wasn't a horse either, right? Because all horses are animals. It says so right there in the dictionary. But he said that synthetic statements do actually have to be verified empirically. Those are the statements that give us new knowledge, not just about what's in the dictionary, but new knowledge about the world. In some so, ways, they're parallel to Aristotle's idea that we talked about before between essential and accidental characteristics, except Aristotle is talking about the things themselves, and Kant is talking about the language, the way we use language to categorize things. Exactly right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're very I welcome. love it when I'm right. <laughs> so anyway, to verify that, that some horses are yeah. animals, uh, uh, that uh, some horses are lame, yeah. you actually have to go out and look at horses. You're not going to find it by looking up horse. You're not going to find it by looking up lame. You actually have to go out and look at the world. So here's a story that actually illustrates the difference between Kant's analytic statements and Kant's idea of synthetic I, I got to tell you, we had to look and look and look. I mean, this is a very technical idea in Kantian philosophy, and we were thrilled when we found this joke. So a man goes into his tailor shop to pick up a custom-made suit. Bespoke, we call that. A bespoke, bespoke suit. Bespoke, yeah. Yes. Mr. Klein, try this jacket on. I think you're going to find this very much to your liking. <laughs> oh. You, yes. you, you call this a, a made-to-order suit, yeah. That jacket is yeah. you. My, my hands don't even come out of the sleeves. Well, that's because you're holding them wrong. Here, put this hand up like this. And I tell you what, if you put this one up in a similar way, and there, kind of like that, that's good. Yeah, th th that's, that's terrific. But now the collar's coming up around my, my neck. Oh, no problem. Just tip your head back. <laughs> oh, that's good. Stop that. <laughs> Okay, now. Uh, yeah, now it's hanging over, the, you know, it's hanging over my behind there, the, the, the back of the coat. This is not a good fit at There's all. There's a perfect solution for that too, Mr. Klein. Just lean forward like that. Now slightly to the left. You got it. Okay. Thank you so much for your business, and please give my name to your friends. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> so as the man walks out of the shop, two passersby see him going out. And the first one says, Oh my God, look at that poor disabled man. My heart really goes out to him. And the second one says, yeah, but his tailor's a genius. He fit him perfectly with that suit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you tell me how that explains synthetic and analytic. I have no idea. No, please! <laughs> <laughs> so the, second, the second observer, the second passerby, thinks he's making a synthetic statement. He's observed how this suit fits, and he thinks it's a perfect fit because it fits this disabled guy. But to the, ta to the tailor, he knows it's an analytic statement because he knows that by definition, any suit he makes for this guy is going to fit him because he fits the man to the suit. Yeah, that's good. So, you know, just to sum up, what we discovered and we've continued to discover is that jokes, good jokes, and, and philosophical insights and concepts are made out of similar stuff. And, and they both tease the mind in, in, in similar ways. Uh, they, they flip our worldviews upside down. They lead us down one path and then switch us to another. And they often expose uh, hidden ideas and uncomfortable truths. So that in the end, what the philosopher calls a really deep or, or, or revealing uh, insight, the gangster calls a zinger. So now whenever somebody tells Daddy and me a joke, we look for the philosophical wisdom in it after we laugh, of course. <laughs>